Okay, good morning, everyone. Bonjour. It is such a pleasure and an honor to be standing here today while we celebrate the Foundation Pour l'Audition, as well as the prize winners for our incredible science that takes place among our scientific community. So I do want to, before I introduce the prize laureates, take this opportunity, uh, because we are so proud of what we've been able to do, the effort by so many people at the Foundation Pour l'Audition, in order to be able to help promote hearing research, not only in France, but worldwide. So with your permission, I will begin with a short slide presentation where I'll go through some of the highlights of our activities. And it's important to do so, so that you are all aware of the resources that we can enable you and those who are beyond this audience today uh, can listen to and understand what it is that they can apply for, what kind of activities we organize. And so let me start by showing you this short presentation. Okay. So I'd, let me introduce myself. I'm Professor Karen Abraham. I am the Vice Dean of the Faculty of Medicine at Tel Aviv University. But my very important hat here is as chair of the scientific committee for the Foundation Pour l'Audition. I'm here to be able to introduce Professor uh, Jeff Holt, who is going to be awarded with a prize very shortly. And uh, also, not only for the scientific grand prize for the Foundation Pour l'Audition, the international prize, but also for the early career prize that we'll be awarding as well. So let me tell you a little bit more about what it is that we're doing. So why is this such an important and relevant problem worldwide? Deafness is recognized as a major public health issue by the World Health Organization. And in fact, they estimate that there are 466 million people worldwide who have a disabling hearing loss. So this is about 5% of the global population. We believe that there, one in three people over 65 have a disabling hearing loss. And it's predicted that in the next 10 to 20 years, this number will go up to 1 billion. So that's an enormous impact on not only public health, but on the health and well-being of individuals everywhere. It also impacts the economy for probably about $750 billion worldwide. Now in France, the problem is, is equally dire. Dire. It's estimated that there are about 6 million people in France who have a moderate or severe hearing loss, and perhaps worse. And a proportion of those individuals suffer from tinnitus, which can be very, very disturbing and disabling. So the mission of the Foundation pour l'Audition is to engage talents to advance hearing health and improve the everyday life of individuals with hearing loss, both in France and beyond. And it is France's first public interest foundation focusing exclusively on hearing health. Now our goal is not only to support research, but also innovation and be able to promote hearing health and provide the resources in order to be able to do so. So first let me tell you about the research program that we have. We have an international scientific committee and I'm very proud to chair this committee of experts who come from France and from the rest of the world. And really, it's a tremendous honor for me to be able to work with these individuals throughout the year. We have three major calls for tender that are going to be coming out in 2020. One is to train the future French talent for research, ENT residents, speech therapists, and audiologists, ENT residents with travel awards, and young clinicians and scientists. We also find it very important to promote French scientific and clinical research excellence by a call for research laboratory grants. And we work on discovering solutions for the hearing impaired with calls for translational research. And we've re recently teamed up with Action on Hearing Loss from the UK, as well as the scientific grand and early career prizes that you'll hear about more today. Over the past years, we have really had, I think, a, what I would consider, and I think you would agree with me, a remarkable research program. We've been able to support 54 laureates, 
And tomorrow we're going to be having a day where we'll be able to honor the laureates and get together for networking. We've been able to provide over six and a half million euros for research support. These include laboratories, scientific prizes, open requests, suit and ships, fellowships, and travel awards. So that's a very long list. We're very busy with calls, with uh, competitive peer review, and being able to award and follow up on the work that's been doing in order to monitor uh, the research and the progress that's occurring throughout. The next calls will be very shortly in December 2019, and then a call in March 2020. And these will be for PhD studentships as well as master studentships. And I do encourage you to pay particular attention to the rules and the eligibility criteria. Some are open for French, others are open for international scientists to come to France. And the idea really is to promote hearing health and research as much as we can in France and beyond by bringing the interaction between both the local, national, and the international community. We also will have a call very shortly for postdoc fellowships as well as MD research fellowships. And I want to emphasize that we care very much about integrating as much translational clinical work into the research so that we can provide solutions to hearing in, in the very near and far future. We also have a call for research proposals for laboratories. These are approximately 300,000 euros per project. There are eligibility criteria, of course, but we provide both grants for basic research, for medical and audiological research, for applied research and technological innovation, for psychology and sociology, and we care very much, again, about grants that will enable us to have an impact on public health. As I mentioned earlier, we have now a translational research call with the Action on Hearing Loss, and we're very proud to have been able to team up with them in order to increase um, the number of grants that the Action of Hearing Loss can give by providing a matching grant from the Foundation Pour l'Audition. We have travel awards in order to encourage our clinicians, our residents, to be able to travel to the United States to the Association for Research in Otolaryngology, one of the main conferences, research conferences that we have. It's an international conference that takes place, uh, and we provide travel awards. Now, as you'll hear much more about today, we offer a scientific grand prize, as well as an early career scientific prize, and that's our honor for today. Uh, and the next call for the next year will be in March 2020. Now, we have two categories for the early career scientific prizes. One is awarded to a young French investigator recognizing his work in clinical research, which we will honor today. And the other is for work in basic research. We also have a scientific grand prize, which we opened to the international community two years ago. And these are evaluated by um, a, a group, um, an ad hoc committee, uh, who are experts in the field. A very competitive prize, and so we're very honored to be able to celebrate that prize today. So we're celebrating that prize with um, four. Professor Jeff Holt, who's arriving from the Boston's Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. I'll tell you a little bit more detail about him when I introduce him before his lecture. And also the Early Career Scientific Prize for Clinical Research is awarded to Dr. David Bacos. He's at Chou de Tour from Tour France. And finally, I want to acknowledge the Betancourt Foundation and Jean P Mr. Jean-Pierre Myers and Francoise Betancourt for their incredible support for the, all of the staff at the Foundation Pour l'Audition, for all of the researchers and Professor Christine Petit at the Institute for hearing research that is about to be opened and we celebrated the inauguration uh, just in September. To Jeff and all of his family members who've arrived today and uh, dear colleagues. So it's really an honor to be able to introduce Jeff. So Professor Jeff Holt, or Jeffrey, as he's known formally, 
did his PhD at the University of Rochester with Professor Ruth Ann Etock. He then went on to do a postdoctoral fellowship with Professor David Corey at the Harvard Medical School. And then he became a faculty member at the University of Virginia Medical School and went on then to join the, the faculty and is now a full professor of otology and neurology at the Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital. So he's now actually across the street from his postdoc mentor and then now work very well together. Now early on, it was already clear that Jeff was a rising star. He was awarded the Burt Evans Young Investigator Award. He's very recently been awarded the Bellucci Prize for Hearing Research as well as the Translational Research Award from the Boston Children's Hospital. And I'm sure something that, that Jeff is very proud of, he was recently awarded the Student Mentorship Award. And I know that, that Jeff is an incredible teacher and takes great pride in training the next generation of scientists in our field. So what has Jeff achieved in about 20, 25 years? A really incredible amount, and we're going to hear from him today. But really, his two major areas and accomplishments is he discovered that TMC1, a critical protein in hearing, is, is the mechanotransduction channel. And in fact, for many years, this was a very elusive question, and it wasn't clear at all uh, what this very important part of the inner ear structure and function was. And Jeff and his team, through really elaborate and, and elegant experiments, were able to show this. He's also, for quite a number of years now, pioneered the techniques for being able to enable gene therapy. And this is so important because as we look for solutions, both from a cellular and genetic point of view, to be able to try to cure and treat hearing loss, Jeff is really one of the leaders in the field, continues to do so, and I think we're going to see a lot of really dramatic achievements in this field in the next couple of years from Jeff and his team. So Jeff, please take this podium and let's hear about your work. Bonjour, et merci Karen, c'est très gentil. Je suis très content d'être ici avec vous aujourd'hui. Je voudrais parler avec vous en français, mais c'est juste un, un je, je sais juste un mot uh, français scientifique, cellule cilier et peut-être uh, TMC1. <laughs> je suis désolé, mais c'est nécessaire que je parle uh, anglais maintenant. <laughs> so for the English speakers, I was just offering some thanks and explaining that I would like to give my talk in French, but I only know a few scientific words in French. So let me begin by saying a big thank you to the, the Foundation pour l'Addition and to the Betancourt Myers family for their generosity, their vision in supporting work uh, from our lab, but also in supporting auditory research here in France and worldwide. It's an incredible honor for me to be here today, to, to speak with you all, to be here in the College de France and, and to talk about our work, but really, I'm just the, the spokesperson, and the discoveries that I'll be sharing with you, and the reason I think I was selected for this prize, are the result of years of hard work by an incredible team of scientists, so I'd like to introduce you to some of them. These are the folks from the lab, and I've been very fortunate in my career to have so many brilliant and hardworking scientists uh, in the lab and as collaborators. And as some of you may know, um, I share the lab with my longtime colleague and partner, Dr. Gwenelle Jeliak. Gwen, can you just wave to everybody? So as you may also know, Gwen is from France, so it's wonderfully satisfying for both her and for me to, to be here today because we run a lab together in the US and it feels like it's coming full circle now to come back and to be recognized for our work in the US by a French foundation. I think this is a, a symbol and, and uh, <clears throat> one of the examples of the strong history and, and the strong friendships and, and strong relationships between France and the US. And I'm very proud that we can be part of that tradition. So I'd like to begin with an evolutionary perspective. 
The ability to sense and perceive sound has provided a powerful evolutionary advantage for countless species throughout the animal kingdom. For example, in the dark of night, in the dark of night, <laughs> sensitivity to sound could allow you to detect an approaching predator or may indicate the presence of a prey species. Clearly, this could give you a strong selective advantage if you could detect those. But at the same time, many creatures co-evolved a unique vocalization, which, are, which is important for being able to recognize members of your own species, uh, for example, in selection of a mate, <whistles> or perhaps avoiding one. <laughs> but the precise frequency selectivity that also evolved allowed us to extend that ability and even recognize individuals. And it could be a strong evolutionary advantage, for example, for a mother to be able to recognize the sound of their own child. And as humans, we've taken advantage of this incredible sound sensitivity to detect frequencies and encode sounds over time to allow us to understand and comprehend language. Indeed, there's over 6,000 spoken languages on Earth today. And as a side effect of this unique ability, we can also appreciate music. So I would like to tell you about an evolutionarily conserved molecule that we have discovered is the key to auditory sensitivity. It's called transmembrane channel-like one, also known as TMC1. TMC1 forms a molecule that allows this unique ability to sense sounds. It converts sound information from the external world into electrical signals that are transmitted to the brain. This ability depends entirely upon a cell type in the inner ear known as the sensory hair cell. So I may be a bit biased, but I think these are some of the most beautiful cells of the body. Their beauty is derived from this exquisite cytoarchitecture that you see right here, as well as their enigmatic nature. They are both perplexingly complex and elegantly simple at the same time. Hair cells have the ability to detect deflection of this apparatus right here by as far as a distance as small as a single gold atom, the diameter of a gold atom. And they can do this with incredible speeds, being able to detect frequencies as rapid as 200 kilohertz in some marine mammals. So they underlie our sensitivity to sound as well as our sensitivity to head movements that mediate the sense of balance. In the human inner ear, there are about 16,000 sensory hair cells within the spiral-shaped cochlea right here. There's another 30,000 hair cells distributed amongst the vestibular organs, the three semicircular canals that sense our ability to, to detect rotational head movements, and the utricle and the saccule that detect sensitivity to linear head movements and gravity. This structure is embedded within the deepest bone of the body, the temporal bone, the, the densest bone, and so they're not easily accessible in humans, so instead we use the mouse as a model system. Here we have an x-ray image of a mouse. This is from Doris Wu with a paint fill of the inner ear structure, so you can appreciate that the anatomy is quite similar to that of the human. At the genetic level, the mouse and the human are also quite similar, so the mouse is an excellent model for studying the genetics of hearing. So we can excise this tissue and look at it from a, a scanning electron micrograph, and that's what we see right here. The organ of Cordy contains one row of inner hair cells, three rows of outer hair cells, and you can see I've colored the cell bodies here in blue. And on their apical surface, they have a hair bundle comprised of this V-shaped structure and an array of modified microvilli, which again are used to sense deflections and sound. Experimentally, when we extract these from the inner ear, we can put them down in a dish in a recording chamber and we can wiggle a hair bundle back and forth. Right here I have a stimulus probe, the cell body is here out of the image, and on the right I plot the position of the hair bundle as well as the response of the cell. So this is current flowing into the cell on the order of several hundred picoamps. When the hair bundle swings to the right, this is a positive stimulus and we see large inward currents. 
When it swings back to the left, this is a negative stimulus, and we see the current level drop back to zero. So the model for hair cell transduction suggests that there's a series of mechanosensitive ion channels here at the tips of stereocilia, and as the bundle swings back and forth, this stimulus will exert a, a force onto these ion channels and gate them, allowing a current to flow into the cell. On the right, I plot a single pair of stereocilia and an enlarged view. So some of these basic elements shown right here comprise the transduction apparatus. As the bundle swings back and forth, you can see the gating or opening of this ion channel. When it's open, cations flow in, primarily calcium and potassium. And because these are charged molecules, they generate an electrical signal that is then transmitted to the brain. Identification of the molecules involved in this process has been a major goal in the field. The tip link structure here is composed of, of cadherin molecules. There are myosin molecules right here that mediate adaptation, and they're likely to be composed of perhaps myosin 7A in cochlear hair cells. The ion channel itself, however, has been a major question mark in the field for at least the past 40 years. The search for this hair cell transduction channel really began with David Corey and Jim Hudspeth back in the late 70s and early 80s, who published a series of manuscripts, which I show just here. This was some groundbreaking work, and one of their key observations was that when they recorded from a single hair cell and wiggled the bundle back and forth, they noted that the response of the cells, shown right here, was incredibly fast. Notice the time scale is here on the order of milliseconds. There was a rise within microseconds, 100 microseconds or less, of the onset of this response. So this is unlike photoreceptors, which are sensitive to light. That had been characterized previously, but they take a couple of orders of magnitude slower in time, hundreds of milliseconds to be activated. So hair cells having this incredible speed led to the suggestion that this might be a direct mechanically, mechanically gated ion channel. And again, this was unlike voltage-dependent channels, which had been characterized at the time, as well as ligand-gated channels were also well understood. A mechanically gated channel was a novel suggestion. This was further elaborated by Jim Pickles a few years later, who discovered these structures here, pictured by Bashar Kashar. These are the tip link structures, and Pickles realized that these things might be able to convey tension and gate the channels. So here, for example, is a, a tensed tip link, which might pull on a, a mechanosensitive channel. Here's one that's slack, which would relax when the bundle swings in the opposite direction. Around the same time, Karen Steele and Greg Bach published a paper using one of the first examples of a deafness model in a mouse. This was simply given the name, the deafness mouse. They characterized this mouse and found that there were no cochlear microphonics that could be recorded at any age in the mutant mouse, and went on to a, a remarkable conclusion based on this, that the most likely explanation for the absence of the microphonic is that the ion channels were not opening properly. This was published in 1980, right at the same time as Corey and Hudspeth worked. I think there was a missed opportunity here. It seems they were both looking at things from different perspectives, one from a genetic point of view, one from a physiologic point of view. And unfortunately, neither one recognized the significance for the other's work. And so this set the field searching for the next 40 years trying to find the hair cell transduction channel. During that 40-year search, there were a number of candidates that came up. Um, here's a, a partial list of ion channel genes that, thought, that uh, scientists thought perhaps could be involved in hair cell transduction. The citations, some of these in very high-profile journals, uh, Charles Zucker's lab in Science, Jim Hudspeth's lab, uh, <coughs> David Corey in Nature, various of these raised interest in the field, but it seems like subsequently, one after another, they were dismissed from further consideration because they were either not expressed in the mammalian inner ear, the gene was not present or expressed in hair cells, knockouts of these genes did not lead to an auditory phenotype. So through this process, the field developed quite a bit of, of skepticism, um, too many false positives that came up, and that also made it uh, challenging for the process. 
We were interested in the same question, the identity of the hair cell transduction channel, and, and participated in some of these studies as well, trip a one HCNs, PKDs. But one on this list in particular we thought was worth a second look, and that was TMC1. TMC1 was first described in 2002 by Andrew Griffith and Tom Friedman in a paper where they identified the gene in the deafness mouse and at the same time, in a back-to-back -back paper by Karen Abraham, who you saw in, with the introduction, here's Karen, and Karen Steele, using a mouse from an ENU mutagenesis screen, identified TMC1, gave it a wonderful name as the Beethoven mouse. I, I always love that name, Karen. <laughs> so together, they identified human mutations and mouse mutations that led to deafness. So this certainly suggested that the TMC1 gene was important for auditory function, but its precise role was not clear. So this was February 2002, and this was quite uh, coincidental and fortuitous for, for Gwen and I at that time, because just a few months prior to that, we had set up our very first lab at the University of Virginia. This was fall 2001 when we set up the lab, and it took us a few months to get the lab set up and functional, but in February 2002, we were ready to go, and I was thinking, this stuff looks interesting. Maybe this is something we could study and, and begin our lab by focusing on this work. And so I called Andrew Griffith and said, hey, we'd like to take a look at this. And, and Andy said, you know, Jeff, I'm not a physiologist. I'm a geneticist, but I see that you're a physiologist, so why don't, why don't we collaborate? And so we decided to work on this together. And Andy said, we're not going to study these, but tell you what, let's make some new mice, let's make some knockout mice, and this was before the days of CRISPR, so it took a couple years actually to generate these mice. So Andy got busy making the mice, and in the meantime, Gwen and I got busy with a couple other projects, and within a couple years, another paper came out from Walter Marcotti and Corne Kroos. They went and studied in a little more depth the Beethoven mouse as well as the deafness mouse, and found nearly normal mechanosensitivity in the hair cells. And so they recognized that TMC1 was important for auditory function, but they concluded that TMC1 was not needed for hair cell mechanosensitivity. Now, what they were unaware of at the time, so their data were absolutely solid and correct, but what they were unaware of was that there was a second gene that was expressed in the hair cells with a redundant function. It's a member of the same family of TMCs and simply given the name TMC2. So TMC2 was expressed in the hair cells, and Andrew Griffith and I thought, well, let's take a look at that one as well. And so Andy generated knockout mice of TMCs 1 and 2. And interestingly, because Kroos and, and Marcotti concluded that TMC1 was not involved in hair cell transduction. It threw most of the field off the trail. And so for five years, we had an opportunity to look at and characterize the TMCs in great depth without competition from our, our, uh, from our other labs, our colleagues. And so we did that over the next five years. And, and also during that time frame, the lab moved to, to Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And we were able to then publish this work in 2011. And so in 2011, this paper came out suggesting that mechanotransduction uh, does indeed require these genes. And one of the first observations was that the mice showed an interesting phenotype. We had mice with TMC1 mutations that lacked mechanosensitivity and were deaf. The TMC2 animals that lacked TMC2 had no real phenotype. They seemed to be mostly normal, but when we made the double knockouts, this is what we saw. So this is a, a little movie made by Yoshi Kawashima. One, two, three, four, the mice had profound vestibular dysfunction, and you can see that these are typical behaviors of a mouse that has balance problems. They have wide gait, they have head bobbing, they tend to run in circles. This immediately suggested to us that TMCs 1 and 2 were involved in this process. Synchronized circling there. So when we looked in the ears of these TMC mutant mice, we were able to 
appreciate the expression pattern of the TMCs, here visualized as a blue stain. So this is the hair cell region in the cochlea. It was restricted just to the hair cells and in the vestibular organs within the hair cells of the saccule and the utricle and in the semicircular canal. So that was consistent with what you might expect for something involved in a hair cell process. So we had these mice in the lab, and I went to the folks in the lab. I asked, who's interested to study these TMC mutant mice? And it seems like one after another, the postdocs, the students said, no, Jeff, you know, there's been too many transduction channel candidates. This is a wild goose chase. It's not going anywhere. I couldn't convince anybody to look at this. And finally, after much persuasion, Gwen rose her hand, and she said, I'll do it, right? And I've been thankful to Gwen ever since then for being the first one to take on this project. And so what Gwen did was she used a dye known as FM143. It's a, a dye that permeates the hair cell transduction channel, and it labels cells that are functional with a green stain. So a normal utricle has a dye pattern uptake like this. When we looked at mice that lacked TMC2, there was also lots of dye uptake. Likewise, mice that lacked TMC1 had a lot of dye uptake. But in the double knockouts, they lacked any dye uptake at all. So it was completely dark field, suggesting that there was a lack of mechanosensitivity in these cells. This is when things started getting interesting, and we realized we were onto something. And so then the other postdocs and students in the lab said, all right, well, Gwen's found something important. Let, let's take a look at this. And Andrea Lelli, who is here today, then began recording from hair cells of the mouse cochlea. Here's a wild-type family of mechanosensory currents. In the TMC2 knockouts, they also had nice currents. And in TMC1 knockouts, a little bit different in the properties, but they had robust mechanotransduction. In the double knockouts, they lacked currents entirely. And this was true throughout the cochlea, both at the apical end, at the basal end, any point during development that we examined this, and in the vestibular organs. Mice lacking TMCs one and two had no mechanosensitivity. Yukako Asai then looked at the expression pattern of the TMCs in the inner ear. And what we found here was that TMC2 expression rose during the first postnatal week of development. You can see the rise right here, which just preceded the onset of mechanosensitivity in these mice. Interestingly, this peaks during the first postnatal week and then declined to near zero. And as it was declining to zero, TMC1 expression began to rise. And that just preceded the onset of hearing in mice at about postnatal day 12. So there appeared to be this developmental switch with TMC2 being expressed first, then followed by a rise of TMC1, which was maintained into adulthood. And it's this expression pattern that I think led to the, the conclusion from uh, Kroos and Marcotti. They were recording at these early stages from cells and saw normal mechanosensitivity, likely because TMC2 was expressed. Had they recorded a few days later during the second postnatal week when TMC2 was gone in the knockouts or the mutants of TMC1, they would have noted a decline of hair cell transduction. So this got a lot of folks interested in the field, and it definitely suggested that the TMCs were required for hair cell mechanosensitivity, but it didn't lead to a direct conclusion of what their role was. They could have been involved as a linker protein, perhaps something needed during development, maybe an accessory protein, or maybe the channel itself. But interest was rising, as well as there was still plenty of skepticism in the field um, based on that long list of, of false negatives that I showed you earlier. But a couple years later, we characterized this a bit further, and Bifang Pan showed that there were some key biophysical differences in hair cells that expressed TMCs 1 or 2. In particular, they had a different reversal potential. These are current voltage relationships, and we found that TMC2 crossed the x-axis right here. TMC1 expressing cells were a little bit more hyperpolarized, and we characterized the Beethoven mouse, which had a single point mutation, one amino acid change, which also caused a change in the reversal potential. We could convert those into permeability ratios for calcium, and realized that TMC2 expressing cells had a very high calcium permeability. TMC1 expressing cells was a bit lower, but with that single Beethoven point mutation, it was uh, a one-to-one -one ratio with cesium. 
So these are key properties. The, the selectivity for an ion is a key property for an ion channel. And this data set really linked the TMCs much more closely to ion channel function. So <clears throat> localization was also an important factor. And in collaboration with Bashar Kashar, Kyoto Karima uh, and, and we showed that these proteins are localized at the tips of stereocilia. This is a TMC1 protein fused to a fluorescent molecule M cherry, where you can see it right here at the tips of both auditory and vestibular hair cells. And likewise, the TMC2 gene was also present here at the tips of stereocilia. This is TMC2 fused at green fluorescent protein. So you can see these green puncta here in auditory and vestibular cells. So the physiology was indicative of TMCs having a role in hair cell transduction, and this localization also was indicative. And so the cartoons that began to appear in the literature and in textbooks uh, began to demonstrate that. And so this is the original model from Jim Pickles, but the more sophisticated models, uh, here pictured by Ole Mueller, showed uh, a more elaborated scheme with some of these other proteins involved, some in, uh, identified by Christine Petit's group um, here in France, Sans, uh, Harmonin, Werlins, and so forth, Cadherins 23 and, and uh, 15. But notice the channel itself still had a question mark. TMCs were listed in this group, suggesting that they might be in here, but it wasn't definitive. A couple of other molecules were suggested to be involved, TMIE or LH. Uh, FPL5. Here's another cartoon showing that the TMCs are, are maybe part of a complex, but, but which part was not clear. And, and yet a third cartoon, again, with a big question mark. And so part of the reason for the, the, the lack of clarity is the name itself. So the name, transmembrane channel-like, is not very convincing, right? Is this a channel or not? It just wasn't clear. And one of the reasons for that was there was not a clearly defined pore forming region. So looking at the topology, here's one topology published by Stefan Heller's group showing eight transmembrane domains, this sort of re-entrant loop right here, but no clear pore region. Another topology shown by Andrew Griffith's lab had six transmembrane domains, this large intracellular region here, but no pore region. Here's another one from Fediplace's lab, six transmembrane domains, two unnamed domains here. I'm not sure why those lacked a name. Um, and then one more topology from Ulrich Mueller's group showing TMCs together with some of the other proteins. But it just wasn't clear. Where was the pore region? And if you're going to call something an ion channel, it's got to have a pore. So we decided to tackle this question and then spent the next five years studying this. And our goals were this. We wanted to really see if we could find some definitive evidence to determine if TMC was indeed a channel or not. And if so, what are the structure function relationships? Where, where is the pore? So which transmembrane domains might line the ion channel pore? And then furthermore, what are the amino acid residues that might contribute to the permeation properties? And so it took five years to generate the evidence. But last year, we published a paper that we think was a definitive study showing that, indeed, TMC1 does form the pore of hair cell mechanotransduction channels. And this was work from uh, one heroic postdoc in the lab, Bifang Pan, as well as Xiaoping Lu. Uh, Bifang recorded from cochlear hair cells. Uh, <coughs> Xiaoping recorded from vestibular hair cells, and also a collaboration with David Corey's lab and Nuranisa Akayuz, who did some biochemistry. And so I'd like to spend the next few minutes kind of summarizing the highlights of this study. So Nuranisa showed that TMC1, if you purify the protein and run it on a gel, actually assembles as a dimer. Here's the monomer for the protein right here of 88 kilodaltons. The dimer has twice that size, which you can see right here. We never saw trimers or, or tetramers. Most ion channels are formed as trimers or tetramers, but TMCs seem to assemble as dimers. And so <clears throat> we were able to then take that purified protein and get some low resolution images. These are cryo EM images, negative staining, showing actual pictures of what the TMC molecule looks like. So again, it's low resolution, but you can see there's sort of this dimeric symmetry in, indicated by the yellow line, and maybe even a couple of pore regions on either side, either subunit. 
So we wondered if this was in fact the case, and we looked at other known dimeric ion channels. There aren't too many, so we had a short list to consider. But we found one in particular known as TMEM 16 a which is a calcium-activated chloride channel that co-assembles as a dimer. And we used a couple of software algorithms that could take a known amino acid sequence for TMC1 and then compare it to known structures of other proteins. And we let the, the programs just make their best guess. And they both predicted that TMC1 might be similar to tmem 16 a We then took that prediction, the predicted structure, and ran a molecular dynamic simulation at Ohio State University with this Owen supercomputer. This was work done in collaboration with Marco Sotomayor. So the supercomputer then was able to take that structure, allow it to relax to its most uh, lowest energy state, and gave us a predicted structure, which was this. This is our prediction for what TMC looks like as a molecule. It has two subunits, one shown in gray and one shown in blue. There are 10 transmembrane domains within the protein, and there are two permeation pathways, one that's right over here, and one that's on this side. So this is kind of uh, unusual for an ion channel to have these permeation pathways. And of course we wondered, is this just some wild fantasy that the computer dreamed up, or does this have any basis in reality? And so to address that question, we designed a series of experiments in which we generated 17 TMC1 constructs, one at a time that carried an amino acid substitution. We took the native amino acid, removed it, replaced it with a cysteine. And I'll explain more about that in a moment. So the basis of those 17 were as follows. We had a prediction now that there were 10 transmembrane domains for TMC1, which are shown right here. And by homology with the tmem 16 a protein, if I zoom in, tmem 16 a the pore region is formed by these domains 4 through 7. So we focused on transmembrane domains 4, 5, 6, and 7 and introduced these point mutations one at a time. And the reason for selecting those were that several of these were known deafness mutations in the human TMC1 sequence. We figured these might be important if they're causing deafness. We thereby reasoned that, well, if so, maybe neighboring amino acids might also have some impact on ion channel function. So we targeted those. A couple of these were negatively charged amino acids right here. These are aspartates. And we reason that since this is a cation channel, positively charged ions passing through, you might need some negative charges to help stabilize that. A couple of these were based on the homology model in transmembrane domains 5 and 6, and then one negative control out here in transmembrane domain 8, which we predicted would not be involved. And so we then took those sequences and we generated adenoviral-associated vectors carrying one sequence at a time. And we injected these into the inner ears of double knockout mice that lack native TMCs, so we could substitute in the gene that we were interested in with the mutation we wanted to, to study. And I should back up and explain. The reason we went to this extent was that the TMCs are not well behaved in a heterologous system. Uh, we've tried, many labs have tried, to put them into a, a standard system like an HEK cell or a CHO cell, but they don't get targeted to the membrane. So we couldn't study them in a, a more isolated situation. We reasoned here that by going back to the native hair cell, it would be a good way to study the function of these particular amino acid substitutions. And so injected these into the knockout mice and then excised their cochleas and kept them in culture for a few days and recorded mechanosensory transduction currents from 566 inner hair cells. Again, this is B. Fang's work, and he did an amazing job with that. And then we were able to apply a cysteine modification reagent, which could uh, hopefully change or, or affect the properties of the channel. And so I told you about the FM143 assay earlier, but here it is again. For a double knockout mouse, we see no dye uptake. But when we introduced the, our, our variance on the TMC1 sequence, we found that we could recover dye uptake. So this showed that these constructs were actually functional and could allow dye into the cell. And it also allowed us to target the fluorescent cells for recording. So Bifang recorded from those inner hair cells that were fluorescent, and here's the summary of all 566 cells. So the amplitudes of current shown on this axis, every single mutation is shown on this axis, 
And most of these had robust currents ranging from about 500 picoamps, 200 to 500 picoamps. A couple of them were quite small, and, and we didn't study those in detail. But most of them had very robust responses. And so the experimental situation was this. We could record from a single cell, deflect the hair bundle, and then wash on a drug known as MTSET. So MTSET is one of these cysteine modification reagents, and the chemistry is as follows. If you have a cysteine amino acid within an amino acid side chain, it has a sulfur side group. And if this sulfur side group is projecting into an aqueous solution, it might be available to react with this modification reagent. MTSET also carries a sulfur side group, and these two can bind, giving you a covalent linkage, allowing you to couple a side chain such as this. So here we've attached a positive side chain and our thinking was, well, if this cysteine occurs within the permeation pathway of an ion channel, you might disrupt or change the ion channel properties. All right, so this is what the experiment looks like. We give a repeating series of bundle deflections and then wash on the drug. Here's when the drug comes on, and then we wash it off right here. And the data appear like this. Nice transduction currents, and as soon as we wash on the drug, boom, we see this reduction in the amplitude. At the end, when the drug washes out, we don't really see a recovery from the effect. So this is consistent with a covalent modification of the channel. Here's another example. Same mutation, different cell, but we get a, the same effect. It was a very robust and repeatable effect. And so we wanted to do a couple control experiments just to convince ourselves this was real. So here's the mutation, but we, we give a puff, but there's no drug here. And so we see no change in the amplitude in this case. One other control was a wild-type cell with the drug, and in this case, we see no change in the current. So this effect was specific to the fact we had a mutation plus the drug. And so we did this for all 17 of the mutations, and here's some of the data. We saw a range of effects. Here's G411, where we saw a, a nice decline in the amplitude of the currents. M412 was a bit slower and smaller. D528 was very rapid and more complete. Some had no effect, as you can see right here. Um, and we've taken these data, analyzed them, taking the first five peaks of the current, an average of that relative to the average of the last five to generate a current ratio, which is shown right here. So a current ratio of one to one indicated there was no change with the drug. But for five of these sites, G411, M412, D528, T532 and D569, we saw a significant decline in the amplitude of the current. So that was strong evidence that these residues are forming or part of the permeation pathway. Next, we wanted to look at calcium selectivity. So in this case, we wash on high calcium and then could record the reversal potentials as I described previously. And we've looked at that as a function of reversal potential. We can convert that to a calcium permeability ratio for all 17 mutations, both before and after application of the drug. Now, this is a lot of data to look at here, but um, that's the entire data set. And let me just summarize by saying that the mutation itself reduced calcium selectivity for seven of the sites, and application of MTSET reduced calcium selectivity at, uh, at five of the, eight of the sites. So together, there were 11 sites that were affected by either the mutation, application of the drug, or both. And again, because selectivity for ions is a, a core property of an ion channel, this very closely implicated TMCs. However, some wondered, well, maybe it's not part of the pore. Perhaps you've got these sites on the outside of the protein, and if you bind it causes some allosteric change, some change in the conformation, which could be transmitted to the pore. And so to address that question, we designed an experiment in which we thought, how about if we use a known pore blocker? So a drug that binds and sits in the pore, and there's a couple that have been characterized previously, which are the aminoglycoside antibiotic, dihydrostreptomycin, and amylaride, are known pore blockers, which will sit right here. So we wondered, well, if these amino acids are within the pore region, maybe we can put this pore blocker on first, which would block the access to these sites. And so when we did that, we put on two millimolar dihydrostreptomycin first, that blocks the current completely. We wash on MTSET, 
And then we wash them both off, and in this case, we see the current recover back to its initial level. Recall with MTSET alone, the currents were blocked and stayed blocked. M412 was also protected, and D569. And so the data are summarized right here. Here's the effect with MTSCT alone, but if you use these pore blockers, well, you can protect those sites from reacting. And so I think it does support this idea that the blocker, the pore blocker, can sit right here and protect these sites and implies that they must be within the permeation pathway. One other experiment was, well, what if we just close the channels? Does that prevent the reaction from occurring? And in this case, we designed an experiment in which we give a deflection, we can open the channels, measure the current. We hold the bundle open here in the interval, give a second deflection later, and see the same amplitude current. Then we open the bundle, uh, push the bundle in the open direction, and we apply the drug, and we see a decline. So that's consistent with, I've showed, with what I've showed you. But what if we hold the bundle in the closed position? So here, the bundle's closed, but we give a test step, those amplitudes are similar. Here it's closed, and we apply the drug, but we see no decline in the current. So when the channels are closed, the drug is not able to get into the pore and access. Here's the open effect, there's closed. So we've done that with this mutation, M412. D569 had the same sort of effect. Channels are open, we see a block. When channels are closed, we see no block. So it's consistent with the idea that if the channels are open here, the drug can get in, but when we push the bundle in the negative direction, channels close and the drug cannot access. So the key observations from this study were, were several. We identified a total of 13 different sites that were affected by the mutation or MTSCT reagents. So five of the sites affected the current amplitude and 11 sites affected selectivity. Three of the sites we studied in more detail because they were associated with human deafness mutations, and we found that they were voltage dependent. I didn't show you those data, but they were part of the publication. We also showed that there's a reduction in single channel currents, and I did show you that these sites are protected by pore blockers or channel closure. So I think together these data strongly support that TMC1 has these four domains that line the channel pore, okay? So coming back, to this topology model, we see that within transmembrane domains four, these are the reactive sites, five, six, and seven. So all four of these transmembrane domains seem to be lining the channel pore. We can then take these sites, map them back onto that structural model, and they appear consistent with this homology model, which is shown right here. So here are the transmembrane domains, domains four, five, six, and seven, and I've colored the reactive residues in gold affected calcium selectivity, magenta affected both selectivity and the current amplitudes, red was one of the ones that almost eliminated the current completely, and the green ones had no effect. And if I put this into motion, you can see this a little bit more clearly. So the permeation pathway would be right through here. So this is the outside of the cell, inside of the cell, and ions are coming right down through the middle. So we think the data strongly support our hypothesis now that TMC1 is indeed a pore forming subunit of the hair cell transduction channel. I don't think that's the end of the story. There may still be more pieces of the puzzle to put together. Other proteins could be involved, TMIE, TMHS, maybe the lipid membrane itself. But I think we have pretty clear evidence at this point that four transmembrane domains are lining and forming the hair cell transduction channel pore. And one other observation, this is from Marco Sotomayor, a simulation that he did again with a supercomputer at Ohio State shows a single subunit of TMC1. This is TMC1 by itself without any other subunits, but he does include some ions here. And if I run the simulation, this is the external side and internal side. You can see multiple permeation events as the ions move through this ion channel pore. So it may be able to, to function on its own. Um, I think that remains to be determined. But with your permission, I'm going to remove the question mark here and replace it with TMC1. <laughs> so we've spent many years now studying the basic biology of the inner ear, trying to understand the, the function of some of these genes and proteins. But at the same time, we've gained a lot of expertise and insight into how to introduce genes into cells and how to, to manipulate function. 
So we've more recently turned towards some translational uh, experiments where we're seeing if we can restore function and perhaps this could be used for gene therapy applications in the future. So TMC1 is also a target of a number of deafness mutations in humans. Here I show the gene structure, the, the map of the, the gene, as well as 35 different mutations that have been identified that cause recessive hearing loss in humans. And there are at least five dominant mutations that have been described. So this is one of the more common causes of genetic hearing loss in humans. I think it's probably on the top five list of, of most common, certainly uh, of the more common ones that affect hair cells. And so we think this might be an interesting target from a gene therapy perspective. And so we developed expertise over the years for injecting viral vectors into the inner ear. We can go through the round window membrane, inject these into the perilymphatic spaces where they can get in at the base and perhaps make their way to the apex. And so we've screened a number of viral vectors, both uh, conventional adeno-associated viral vectors as well as uh, some synthetic vectors. And this is one known as ANK80 that we identified that transduces hair cells with green fluorescent protein. You can see lots of GFP positive cells right here. Here's the GFP image alone. Large numbers of inner hair cells and about 80% of the outer hair cells can be targeted with this vector. We've come across a, another vector that we like even better recently. This one um, was published by David Corey, but we've found that it, it works even better than ANK80. We get 100% of the inner hair cells and 90 to 95% of the outer hair cells are transduced by this one known as AAV9, the PHPB variant. And so we've been using these synthetic vectors to introduce the TMC sequences into the inner ear. And so here's a high magnification view just showing that again, 100% of the inners and 95% you know, or so of the outer hair cells can be targeted. So with the synthetic vector driving the correct sequence, this is not a mutant version, but the wild type sequence injecting these into the cochleas of TMC mutant mice, we wanted to see if we could recover function. And first we found this is myosin 7A now, a hair cell marker, not GFP, but that the vector could promote strong survival throughout the, the turns of the cochlea. So we've quantified that. We can count the hair cells in a wild type mouse. The TMC mutant animals, the hair cells begin to die. We see very few cells left here at one month of age. But after introducing our gene therapy vectors with TMC1, we find we can promote hair cell survival. And so we've quantified that just here. Next question is, are these cells functional? And so we recorded from these cells uh, mice lacking TMCs have no response when we deflect their hair bundles, but both outer hair cells and inner hair cells at late, as late as one month of age have robust mechanotransduction currents. And their properties, their stimulus response curves were very similar to those of wild type. We've quantified the amplitudes, which were also similar to wild type. So we can promote cell survival and recover function at the level of single cells. What about at the level of the cochlea? So for this, we use an auditory brainstem response recording. This is simply putting scalp electrodes on the back of the head, playing sounds into the ear, and then recording the compound activity of the eighth cranial nerve. And so for a wild-type mice, we play louder and louder sounds on this axis, and you can see these squiggly lines here indicate that the mouse can actually hear the sounds that we're playing. This is an eight kilohertz tone in this case. A deaf mouse doesn't hear anything. The flat lines all the way up to 120 dB suggests there's no response whatsoever. But if we take one of our TMC mutants and introduce with a synthetic vector the TMC1 sequence, we find we can recover these responses with auditory thresholds as low as about 30 to 35 dB, which would be about like this. So it's an impressive level of recovery. Um, that was one of our best case examples. We've done this with a range of different mice. And, and so the responses vary, these gray lines shown here, depending on the, the quality of the injection itself. Um, the wild type response is shown just here, deaf mice in black. We used a second assay known as a DPOAE, distortion product autoacoustic emission, which is a measure of outer hair cell function in particular. And we see that we get nice DPOAE thresholds as well. So we're recovering outer hair cell function and whole cochlea function. Of course, for sounds to, to be meaningful, they'll need to be perceived in the brain. So we then asked what's going on in auditory cortex. And in collaboration with Dan Polly's group, 
we recorded from the contralateral auditory cortex using a multi-electrode array. So here's the injected ear, and we play sounds into this ear, and then record the activity of the contralateral auditory cortex. And what you're looking at here is a raster plot as a function of time. This is loudness on this axis, and each spot here is the firing of an action potential. So for a normal mouse, you begin to see responses right here. A TMC mutant animal that has no auditory function, there's some random firing of action potentials, but there's no sound-evoked activity in auditory cortex. But after introduction of our vectors into the periphery, the inner ear, we recover function there, but in cortex we also see we can begin to get sound-evoked stimuli, sound-evoked responses. And so we've done this with over 300 auditory neurons. Uh, in gray are wild-type neurons, and in green are the injected animals. And so what you'll notice, this is a lot of data to look at, but let me point out that we get best frequencies around 8 kilohertz, and the thresholds tend to be some of the best cases as low as about 30 or so uh, decibels. But interestingly, the shape of these curves, these are tuning curves for individual neurons, the shapes of these are very similar, suggesting that the tuning properties are similar to wild type, and that's summarized right here. So <clears throat> this data would suggest that indeed we're able to drive recovery that may lead to perception of sound. What about behaviorally? Well, we can't really ask a mouse if he can hear, but what we can do is play a sudden loud sound, and like you might be startled, a mouse will as well, and will jump in response to this loud sound. And so for a deaf mouse shown here in red, these are the TMC mutants, they don't jump no matter how loud a sound we play. The wild types are shown in black, but the in green show the TMC mutants that were injected, and we begin to see these recoveries right here that look very similar to wild type. So their behavioral responses seem to be recovered as well. We also looked in the vestibular system and found that through a single injection into the cochlea through the round window membrane, we can also get vestibular hair cells that are targeted and transduced. So this is the utricle and the semicircular canals, the saccule and the horizontal canal are all targeted quite robustly by a single injection. And so we wondered, can we recover function here as well? And so for this study, we used the double knockout mice, which lack auditory and vestibular function, and we used a measurement of the vestibular ocular reflex, which serves to keep the eyes stable in space. As you turn your head back and forth, as you move around in the world, the VOR is critical for keeping your vision stable. And so we could track the eye positions of wild-type mice. So here we're rotating the head back and forth. They have these compensatory eye movements. The TMC mutants lack vestibular function, and so they have no real eye movements that were linked to the stimulus. But after injecting these animals with our gene therapy vectors, we find that we can recover their vestibular ocular reflexes, and they had a gain of the response in the phase that was similar to wild type. So we can do that for rotational head movements, which suggests there's recovery in the semicircular canals, and we can also do it with a linear side-to-side -side movement, and we see recovery here as well with the same sort of thing, suggesting there's recovery in the otolith organs, the utricle and the saccule. And so one other data set that we, we actually discovered in the course of this study was that uh, the mice were poor breeders. So wild-type mice breed prolifically. They tend to have about one litter every month. But the TMC mutant animals, they lack auditory function, they lack vestibular function, and as a result, they're very poor breeders. They have one litter every three or four months. And so this sort of comes back to what I said at the beginning about evolution being critical. It's, un it's easy to understand here with these data that the contributions of auditory function may be important for, for mating skills in this case. If we injected these animals, we find that we could recover their ability. So we've restored auditory and vestibular function, and sure enough, their ability to breed has recovered as well. Turns out they're also better parents. Um, those litters that did serve, uh, that were born here actually didn't survive too well um, out to uh, one month of age, the wean age, but injected animals were better parents and they could indeed uh, survive to later stages. We tracked their growth rates as well, and a wild-type mouse over an eight-week period will grow from about 15 grams up to about 25 grams. The TMC mutant animals had, they did grow, but they had a stunted growth rate that you can see here. So we wondered if we injected the parents whether this would improve their growth rates. In fact, it didn't. 
um, their growth rates were about the same. But if we injected both the parents and the offspring, we were able to recover their growth rates nearly completely. Again, suggesting that auditory function can be key to some of these survival issues. OK, in the last few minutes here, I would like to turn to what do we do for dominant mutations? We wondered, could we use this same sort of gene replacement strategy that we use for recessive mutations? And we tried that, but in fact, it did not work too well. We were not able to overcome the consequences of a dominant mutation. Instead, we devised an alternate strategy, which was to use genome editing. We developed a CRISPR-Cas strategy and I'm not going to go through all the details of, of CRISPR-Cas, but let me just summarize some of the highlights. The thinking was that in a mouse or a human where you've got one correct gene sequence when we all carry two, and one sequence that carries a dominant mutation, maybe you can selectively target the dominant mutation, disrupt it, and leave the correct wild-type sequence intact. And so a conventional approach for CRISPR would be to use a guide RNA that would recognize just the Beethoven mutant allele in this case, but not the wild type. We tried that, and in fact, that strategy did not work too well. It wasn't selective enough. We ended up disrupting both the Beethoven and the wild type, so that would also lead to a hearing loss. Instead, we identified a different Cas9 enzyme, which is known as SA Cas9, and we use the KKH variety, which had a protospacer adjacent motif shown here in green. This is the PAM sequence. The PAM sequence of the enzyme was specific to recognize the Beethoven mutation, but did not recognize the wild type. So we had a guide RNA that recognized both, brought our Cas9 to the right spot. And so the Cas9 then could cut and disrupt the Beethoven allele, but not the healthy wild type allele. And so we confirmed that in an in vitro assay and found that this strategy with this guide 4.2 had 99% specificity for the wild, sorry, for the Beethoven over the wild type. So one other advantage of this particular SA Cas9 is it's small enough to fit into an AAV vector. So we could put the coding sequence for our CRISPR Cas9 enzyme into the vector along with the guide RNA and then inject that into the ears of Beethoven mice. We actually began by injecting it into the ears of wild-type mice just to confirm that there weren't off-target effects or we weren't disrupting cell function there. So here we got normal counts where we saw no decline in the number of cells and no decline in auditory function. When we injected it into the Beethoven animals, here you can see significant loss of hair cells in this region, but in the injected animals we were able to preserve hair cells, um, and this was best at, at the mid-frequency regions but we've quantified that here as well. When we looked into the ears of injected animals, we could use uh, scanning electron microscopy to look at wild type hair cells right here. The Beethoven animals have these severely disrupted hair bundles, which you can recognize. Both the outer hair cells and the inners have disrupted morphologies. But in the injected animals, you can see that their hair bundle shapes were preserved quite nicely. And here's a higher magnification view showing that. So morphology being preserved suggested that, well, perhaps the function of these cells is also preserved. And so we looked at auditory function, again, using the, the ABR assay, and we've tracked these over time at 4, 8, 12, and 24 weeks. Here I show the wild-type auditory thresholds. These are normal hearing mice, have stable thresholds through this time. The Beethoven animals have a progressive hearing loss, elevated thresholds at four weeks. They get worse and worse, such that by 24 weeks, they're profoundly deaf. But in the Beethoven animals that we injected with our CRISPR-Cas9 strategy, we find thresholds that are very similar to wild type, and we find that these are stable over time. And we've gone now as late as one year post-injection and find stable thresholds. So I would like to wrap up with some conclusions. Um, first, of course, we think that TMC1 is indeed forming the hair cell transduction channel. We think this is true in humans and in mice, and more broadly throughout the animal kingdom. We think this is indeed the key molecule that enables the conversion of sound into electrical signals. And we've analyzed this in the animal kingdom now, uh, looking at 114 different species. I show the TMC1 sequences right here. They're present 
uh, in, in fish, amphibians, birds and reptiles, and in the mammals. And interestingly, the mammalian branch of TMC1 forms this separate branch right here, which seems even more highly specialized, perhaps important for the detection of high frequency sounds. We've talked about TMC1 gene replacement, restoring function and for both auditory and vestibular organs. So we've been able to inject just a microliter of virus through the round window membrane, and we see recovery of function in six sensory organs. So it's, it's better than a, a two for one sort of deal. I think we're getting six with one injection. I think that this approach could actually be used and maybe translated to the clinic for recovery of function in patients who carry TMC1 mutations. And I frequently get asked the question, well, when is this gonna happen? And that, that's a tough question to answer, but I'm gonna go ahead and throw a number out there. I, I would say within the next three to four years, I would like to see this get into clinical trials. And now that's an ambitious statement, but I think now is the time to be ambitious. For dominant mutations, we've used this genome editing a strategy, and we've shown that we can preserve auditory function. There are multiple dominant mutations in TMC1 that could be targeted with this sort of approach as well. If I were gonna place my bets, my first bet is on the gene replacement strategy as, as making it into the clinic sooner. Um, I think there's still uh, some things that need to be worked out. There's some safety issues with, with CRISPR-Cas9 and gene editing. There may be some ethical issues associated with it. So I think we need to tackle some of those before we start injecting this in the ears anytime soon. Um, but I think it's something that may be coming on down the road. In addition, the strategy that we worked out with the Beethoven mice, we think may be broadly useful. We use this novel enzyme, it's the SA-Cas9, coming from a different bacteria, and this one particular PAM sequence. And by using this alternate strategy, we think that we may have a precision medicine approach that could be used to target multiple different dominant forms of human disease. We've gone through an analysis where we looked at all dominant mutations that are present in the ClinVar database. There's about 17,000 of them. And by using the PAM sequence to target those, a conventional SA-Cas9, we can target 1,300, and with our modified Cas9, we can target about 3,700. So together, about 5,000 dominant mutations could be targeted with this strategy. So I think it could be broadly useful, and things that are on this list include Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, different forms of epilepsy. It's a big list. So that database is published if you're interested to look at that. Also on the list are 15 other hearing loss genes, and we think the strategy could be useful for targeting any of these as well. So thank you for your attention. I want to just conclude now with uh, some acknowledgments. Again, this is the team from the lab, as well as my collaborators who have contributed to this work. And this has been one of the, the greatest joys of doing science, is being able to, to work with all these wonderful, wonderful folks and to be able to do the work and, and share my, my work and my life with Gwen in the lab has been fantastic. Of course, I also want to acknowledge the funding um, from the various foundations who have supported the lab. Um, including donations from, from individuals, uh, the Usher Syndrome Society, uh, NIH and NIDCD, support we get from Boston Children's Hospital. And now I'm, I'm very happy that we can add Foundation Pour la Dicion to our list of, of funding support. This is a, a wonderful to, to be part of the, the team and family for the FPA.